All right, sorry about that delay. Okay, so the midterm uh, review, so uh, that's today. So basically I've got a couple of sort of prepped uh, slides to kind of hope maybe generate questions, but if you already have questions, we can just, just focus on those. The timeline moving forward is that next week, um, and I just want to emphasize that you don't have to be here next week. So uh, the exam is all online on Canvas. Um, exactly the availability windows uh, are still flexible, and so I'll talk about that here in a second. But definitely Tuesday will be all day Tuesday will be stage one. It's a timed exam. You get 90 minutes when you start. If you do come to class during this class period for Tuesday, <clears throat> probably have to cap you at 75 minutes uh, because of the next class that usually comes in. Uh, but <clears throat> if you take it anywhere else, that's the full 90. And uh, the reason it's 90 is not because I, you know, packed in a lot of questions, but just if there are any technical challenges, you know, getting lockdown started and everything like that, then that extra 15 is supposed to help with that. Um, so uh, that will be Tuesday. So 80% of your midterm score will come from that individual exam. It's non-collaborative. It's closed book. It's closed notes. I do let you bring uh, two two-sided pages of uh, hand-produced notes. They can be typed. Uh, they can be you know drawn digitally. The <clears throat> thing I just want to avoid is you making photocopies or screen captures of content that you haven't produced and just putting that in in that form. So you can redraw graphs and things yourself, but I just want you to actually go through the process of using either your own hands to type or your own hands to draw um, and decide what you want to put on there as opposed to just copying and pasting things all shrunken down. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of what I'm saying here. And then on Thursday, there's the exact same exam. You do not get your scores or solutions between the two days, but exact same exam, but you can collaborate with other students currently enrolled in the course. If you want to come here and work together during the class period, that's fine. If you don't, if you want to work elsewhere, if you want to work individually, um, it that is also fine. If you want to use Slack or Discord, that's fine, just so long as the only other people participating in that channel uh, are other students currently enrolled in this course. <clears throat> so that's kind of the structure here. Um, and uh, and so <clears throat> actually maybe let's just handle the availability here. So there's options for availability. So let me bring these up and then we'll do an eye clicker just as a poll so I can see what the preferences are. So uh, let's see how this looks here. Okay, so um, so these are kind of the options. Uh, my preferred option, and I'll tell you why, um, is this option A. So basically what this would mean is you could get all of Monday and all of Tuesday to start your stage one. And whenever you start it, then you get 90 minutes, the clock would start. And then stage two, you could get all of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday to submit your stage two. The reason I prefer that, and it's purely, I, I, I mean, I, for me, it actually doesn't matter too much. But the reason that I lean towards that is a lot of times I have students in the week before um, the fall break will make travel plans towards the end of that week. And, and a lot of times those travel plans uh, just do to... You know, maybe there's a wedding happening or something like that that you might have to leave in the middle of Thursday. And so sometimes then I'll, I'll get students ask about, you know, extra flexibility or whatever. And so, <clears throat> I mean, there's always Friday and Saturday. There's plenty of time there. But a lot of people just like to get done, their, you know, have to feel like their exams are submitted and just out before any of that. So I don't know if anybody in here is like that, but there might be, even if you aren't that way, there might be someone else that way. So for me, given the fall break, this option A up here, where the you know stage two starts way over here on Wednesday, provides the most flexibility for those of you who might be traveling before the break. That is the only reason why I would um, recommend stage or this A. But the um, you know the uh, B is might be nice that maybe you don't want to take your stage one Monday or Tuesday. Maybe you'd like to you know wait a little. I, mean, I don't know what your schedules are. So um, you know in that case. You know, maybe it'd be nice to be able to start stage uh, uh, one on Wednesday. Um, now, the the what's going on in C and D is I basically drop a Monday out of the mix. Why is that there? Once I open the availability, I can't answer any content questions about the exam until the exam's complete. 
So, and that's just as if one of you takes it and says, I took it, I submitted it, and they might tell to somebody else, there's a really difficult problem about ham simulation or something like that. Um, you might want to, you know, look up, uh, you know, this topic or whatever. Well, if somebody then comes to me and asks me about a question about that, I might not realize that they're asking me about something that is specific to the exam, and I won't know, you know, and so rather than putting me in that awkward situation of trying to figure out if I'm accidentally giving an answer to the exam, I just say, I can, I can answer administrative questions when the exam is open, but I can't answer any content questions. So for those of you who think that you might have questions over the weekend and you want to have Monday available to reach out to me um, to, <clears throat> to ask for those questions, then um, it might be a good idea to go with one of these options. But, um, but again, I prefer A, because uh, you know, I actually usually rarely get a whole lot of the contact before the exam. Um, and, uh, and A provides the most flexibility for kind of everybody there. So those are sort of the four options. I'm going to put up a little eye clicker where I just want to pull you on this to see sort of where the class is. It's not binding or anything. I'm just kind of seeing what your preferences are. Are there any questions about these options for the availability? Well, let me pull up then multiple choice all right so go ahead and uh you know I'm not looking for a right answer here or anything but um you know what is your preference a b c or d so go ahead and put that in again it's not binding i'm just kind of looking to see where the class sits and uh, right now i think i just have it set uh, if you were to look at it, I think it's currently configured in the B option. Um, but so, you know, again, my preference is A, and I could switch it back to A, but if everybody picks B, then I might leave it in the B. But, um, you know. Yep. <clears throat> if it's your own, if you have at one time drawn it out, I'm okay with that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I just want you to go through the physical process of at one time reproducing it yourself. All right, twenty-ish. It's probably um, good. I like. I can leave. I'll just let that poll run. Um, and actually, you know, um, I, I so I took that I clicker response, and I'll I'll leave that up there running. Um, but this period is really meant to be for you, not for the class. And so um, <clears throat> I'm not, I, I probably even think I'm just going to excuse the uh, the attendance for today um, now that I've kind of taken this. So if you have other things to do, you can feel free to leave. Um, but, uh, but you know, the, the, so there's not that clicker I'm just taking for my information. Um, so I'm not going to do any more clickers for the rest of this. So I'm just going to let that run all throughout this period in case you change your mind or anything like that. And I'll see how it looks at the end here. Okay, so let's get back to this. Um, resources, there's a bunch of resources about the midterm that's out there. So for one, um, you know, if you go into the midterm module, which you'll have to complete that lockdown browser uh, test, that uh, compliance test, Make sure to do that, preferably like this week, today, um, to make sure that everything's working fine for you. But once you do that, you'll open that midterm module up, and there's a whole bunch of like sample midterms from previous semesters and solution sets. There's even one that's Canvas-based that'll be a very similar format and structure as this midterm, so you can go ahead and try that. You know, that score, it's just a practice midterm. It doesn't affect your grade. Um, there are homework solution sets, of course, on Canvas. Um, there are, you know, the other practice activities, um, every lecture is, says what chapter corresponds to it, if you need sort of extra help with that. And of course, there's the AV capture of each one of the lectures. So a lot of resources available on Canvas. Um, and this is kind of what I was explaining already, stage one and stage two, replace the lecture periods. If you're happy taking the stage one and stage two elsewhere, you do not have to come to class. Um, any of next week, <clears throat> I will be here both days next week at this time. If nobody shows up within the first 15 minutes, I'll probably leave, but I'll be here making sure the room is, is available for you. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to put any statistical tables on your formula sheets. I provide, you know, chi-squared, uh, normal, et cetera. 
um, chaos test, all of that stuff will be provided at the top of the exam so that you have that available for you. <clears throat> There are a couple of formulas, like the runs test formula. I'd recommend sort of knowing that. It's probably a good one to have on there. I won't give you that one. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's any other major formulas. If some's come to mind, I'll, I'll point it out. But that's kind of the big one that I, 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 it's a little weird. Like it's a weird formula that I don't have memorized. Whenever I need it, I look it up. Um, but it's one of these formulas that if I give you, I kind of give away a lot of how to do the runs test. So I, I kind of want to make sure you know to, that you need it. So I can't just provide you like random formulas and have it in the mix. So that, that's like one of the ones where I'd say I'd recommend writing that one down. But generally speaking, like, like for example, the formulas for the probability density functions for the uh, different uh, probability distributions, you don't need to know those. If you need those, I'll give you to them. I would know their shapes, though, their general shapes and what the parameters do to those shapes. So as you increase K, um, you know, it makes it more hump shaped. As you decrease K, it makes it more kind of ski slope, um, those sorts of things. <clears throat> um, they're, you know, the format of the exam, they're going to, it's Canvas style or Scantron style. I mentioned that just because a lot of the previous ones were Scantron style. So, um, you know, it's that they're auto graded. There's no sort of essay questions. There might be some numerical questions. Um, so, for example, I could have you uh, generate a cumulative distribution function and then ask you to evaluate it at a particular point. So what is capital F of 4.2. And uh, then you have to plug that into the expression you got, and then that's the answer that you have to fill in. So that's an example of how I could test you for like those CDFs. Um, I do sometimes try to make things a little more exciting. So, um, you know, like it, 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 like select all questions I think are are interesting, but I try to use any questions I use on Canvas to the extent that Canvas allows, I try to provide partial credit. That said, um, as I every question here will be uh, one point. Um, and so that means that even questions, questions that simply ask you to sort of recite a definition will be the same point as a question that asks you to, uh, here's a probability density function, calculate the CDF and evaluate that number. That will also be one point. Because it never made sense to me that like, if it's a really long question, I guess you'd need a little bit of credit for it. But like, when you go to an engineering job interview, like if you don't know the basic definitions, that's often more damning than not being able to do the little like technical homework problems that sometimes that the recruiters like you to do. So it never quite made sense to me why we'd like charge you 10 points for uh, a, a calculus problem, but only one point for like a fundamental that if you didn't know, like you couldn't, it wouldn't, it'd be like, it's a shibboleth for being an engineer. Like you couldn't pass muster. No one would like know like that. Like, it's like, what, why are you even here if you don't know that term? So like, to me, it seems, you know, like those are the things that are, so that's why you're going to see that like, like you're like, Ted, I, I spent, you know, five minutes on this problem, but 20 seconds on this one. Like, why are they, the same amount. Well, it's probably that this one you spent five minutes on is actually like nobody's ever going to ask you to do that after this class. So why would I charge you, you know, you know, twenty points if you got that wrong? So th that's the reason why there's this like balance. Um, and then of course the exams were twenty percent of your course grade, but that's split eighty percent, uh, twenty percent across the individual and the group. And that lockdown browser test that actually eats away at a little bit of the individual. So you do that lockdown browser test, you already get like 0.25% free of your whole final course grade. And then the next compliance test you'll take at the final exam will be another 0.25%. So that's how things are, are, are set out that way. But my basic kind of idea when I build the exam, and I'm still tweaking it a little bit, but um, most of the questions are set. Um, I just did a couple of little things this morning too, but uh, but basically it's, uh, I, you know, I, I try to get, you know, 10 to 13, most of the questions are these kind of multiple choice kind of conceptual questions. A couple of numerical questions like, um, you know, doing a hand simulation. And then, so I might give you a hand simulation table and there'll be a couple of spots that are empty. And I'd be like, what is the number that should be here in the hand simulation table? So then you have to kind of go through the hand simulation and figure out what that number is. Um, generating a sequence of pseudorandom numbers. So, you know, doing your LCG, uh, statistical test of uniformity, I give you 20 numbers and ask, are they uniform? Are they independent? Um, you know, so uh, collectively, you know, maybe two to three problems, like one of each of these, and then a design problem. So, um, you know, there might be one question about 
going from PDF to CDF, another question uh, going from CDF to quantile functions, CDF to inverse CDF, and both of them might have you do a little math and then evaluate them at a number. So that's kind of the idea here. So most of the stuff is going to be up here, but then there's going to be some down here, but every problem will be one point. So roughly, uh, let's say, I think it's, you know, 35 questions or so, 35 to 38 maybe, or 40. So something in that ballpark. But I'll just tell you, so you're not surprised by this, the first three questions that you get credit for are making sure you've done the lockdown browser stuff. Like, it, well, I, I asked you, the first question is like, did you show your ID? If you didn't show your ID to the camera right now, and then you say, yes, I show my ID, one point. Um, sh did you show your environment? If you didn't, show the environment right now, one point for that. Uh, did you show me your, uh, your, your formula sheets? If you didn't show me the camera right now, check that one point. And um, and then I think I also ask you about uh, the um, that did you do you understand that stage one is individual and stage two is group? Um, yes, there are four points done already. And then at the end of the exam, um, I ask you because you know you got the final projects coming up after the exam, and I say you know do you know that there's a final project coming up and you're going to need to form teams you know two weeks after stage two is due. Um, and that you'll eventually then a week and a half after that have to give a small uh, you know proposal on what you want to model. And so you check both of those and that's one or two points. So already almost 20% of the exam is free. So there's a bunch of that that's I just, so when you hit those questions, don't be surprised. They're not trick questions. Like really just answer them. Well, I mean, answer them truthfully, but answer them truthfully, yes. And, uh, and you'll get, you know, that out of that, 35 to 40 points, that's like six points. It's just free for you. So um, so that's the basic structure. Um, any questions about the, the general format structure, how things operate? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, feedback, looking back at homework uh, B1, B2, or B1, C2, and D2, and um, I know you've got grades for B1 and C2 that are posted. Um, I think, you know, D2 is still out. So we don't, we won't grade that. So we won't have your grades for the midterm because, you know, technically the availability window is till like Saturday night. So they're just not going to get graded uh, in time to know beforehand. But um, I can at least give you a little feedback in general on the, the basic. So, you know, what we see in B1 and C2 and then what we generally see in D2. So um, going back, remember B1, um, you know, just remember these different definitions of these different types of things we talk about in SIM. So uh, one of the things that's often confusing here is events versus activities. Events are instantaneous. So you might say like, like you know, Ted's class is an event. And that might be true in the small E sense, but in the large E sense, um, it's, you know, and an event is an instant. It's more like, no, the start of the class is an event and the end of the class is an event. Those are instantaneous. Whereas the activity, that's how long the class lasts. And so you could say that, you know, whereas Dr. Merchandani, um, you know, I never know whether we're going to go, uh, you know, 50 minutes or 75 minutes, um, you know, and in Ted's class, he always goes 75 minutes plus or minus 30 seconds. And sometimes we're late and it really pisses me off, you know, or something like that. That distribution, that is an activity. So the fact that, you know, it's a it's a length of time. Um, and uh, so there's some examples there. The future event list. Remember, that's an E is for event uh, state variables and states. Um, you know, this is just a, a standard dynamical system modeling confusion thing that people often confuse these two terms. Um, states go into state variables. So the state variable is the number of customers, but the actual state of the system is two. Like that's, a, you know, there are currently two customers in the system. That's the system state. Where do we keep track of the state in the number of customers variable? So that's kind of an example of that. And um, state variables change at events. So the, whenever a state variable changes, there had to be an event at that instant. That is a feature of discrete event system simulation. So if I were to ask you um, something about, you know, what is the time instant where a state variable would change, what you're looking for there is event. So that's kind of um, some, of the, some of the homework one, uh, the first part. Then in the second button, you know, execute a DES by hand. Definitely know, re recall how to do this. So practice this. I guarantee you, 
there will be a question on the exam where you're going to have to know how to execute a discrete event system simulation by hand in order to get the right answer. Um, so you might just need to know structural things, like you might need to know that they're for a process that has only one arrival um, you know, point, only you know, creates one type of entity, you're always going to have exactly one arrival activity in the future event list at all times. That might be a question that I just ask, or I'd ask it in a way like, what's wrong with this table? And you would notice that the table doesn't have an activity in a particular row. And you say, ah, that's the problem is that, you know, at time 46, there's no uh, arrival um, uh, event in the future event list. So that's obviously a problem because there always should be one arrival event in the future event list because there's one arrival process. Um, so that would be, you know, but just in general, know how to do the sim. Like, like if I, you know, know how to do three lines, like to unroll three lines of a uh, DES. Uh, be uh, careful not to schedule events too soon when you're doing that. So that's a, another thing that, you know, even though you can see that several arrivals are coming down, you only do the next one. Uh, departure event is only scheduled the instant that the service has started. So even though you can see that you know when things are going to depart, you can't actually add it to the FEL until that service has started. Um, so that's another common issue. Um, so, um, you know, the schedule activities and not events. So uh, an activity arrives at an instant will last in a particular time. So um, the so the idea here is that, uh, you know, we get, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the, the whenever a service starts, that's when you schedule the end of it. So uh, it's just, you only schedule one activity at a time. So you wait for the activity to start the event that triggers the activity, and then you draw that activity number, and then you just schedule the single ending event at a time. Um, so that's homework B1s, like major feedback. Those are sort of the issues that we see. So any questions about hand simulation? Now, when I get through this, this review is just, you know, basically going back through the highlight slides. And so um, if there are no questions and people still want to hang around, then I can go back through here and say, oh, and reminder, you know, this is what we did in the, the first couple of lectures. We did the next couple of lectures. So this isn't the only material I've got here to kind of jog your memory, but I just wanted to go through the homework feedback first. So based on that one, and this could be questions about something else that that's jogged. Any questions at this point that I can help with? Yep. Uh, oh, the lab assignments, does the exam go over the lab stuff? Uh, now there, I mean, there certainly are lab things that integrate, I would say, let me answer it a different way. There will be very little, I'm not gonna ask about NetLogo, no NetLogo on the exam, though you probably should know the difference between an agent-based model and a discrete event system simulation. Um, I'm not gonna ask you much about ARENA. I mentioned in the last lecture that knowing the syntax of DISC, like knowing if you had to write out disk and like actually fill out the arguments, that's probably a good thing to know. Uh, but knowing how to draw and read a, a diagram in arena, that you won't need to know until the final. So um, so that's kind of gives you an example of that. Now, the, that there, there are labs like that where you were doing hand simulation. So like that lab would be a great practice for knowing hands because that's, it'd be very reasonable for you to ask you a hand simulation problem like the muffin baking sim, just like a hand simulation model, like <clears throat> the uh, the one we did in the homework B1. So particular details about Arena, we won't go much farther than like, do you know how to write disk? Because that kind of folds in to the stuff that we were just talking about in the lecture. But NetLogo, outside from knowing the NetLogo is an agent-based model, you won't need to know like, you know, how to program a NetLogo. So, and the, I mean, again, looking back, I'm giving you like six sample midterms. And every midterm I write the same way. Like I just kind of look, all right, in this lecture, what do I think the, or in this unit, what do I think the learning outcomes should be? And this, you want to learn. And then based on those learning outcomes, I draw questions. And so look for consistencies there. And I think one consistency you'll see is there very little lab representation pre midterm. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, then in the homework C2, 
uh, getting into a little more numerical stuff, random number generation. There's a bunch of weird little things that you just have to be very careful about. They're a little surprising, but like at this point in our careers, we don't often like do a lot of numerical calculations. And so these things come up, I guess. We just sort of forget. Um, and I'll get to that here in a second. But, um, you know, so, you know, the uh, remember that the term random numbers, uh, that specifically means drawn from a uniform distribution that is spread between zero and one. So the term random number that is in this class means is very, very specific. That means it is a number between zero and one drawn uniformly, but in that interval, now, we're not, it's not a generic random number. There's no such thing as an exponential random number. If it's drawn from an exponential, then that's a random variant. So we, you know, a random variant is drawn from a generic distribution. A random number is a random variant from this distribution. Um, for the LCG, remember that the random number, in order to be between zero and one, it's got to be that internal state variable X divided by the modulus. So if I ask you for a random number, don't give me a four digit, you know, number between zero and 10,000. It has to be a number between zero and one. And the first number is not the seed divided by the modulus. The first number is the number that you get after plugging your seed in. And then that, whatever pops out of that first expression, that's going to generate the first number. So that's what I'm saying here. The seed should not be used to generate your first number. Your first random number, you take that seed, you plug it into LCG, that'll give you X1. Um, that X1 then gets divided by the modulus. And then that uh, becomes the first number. And that's because the seed is not random. You know what the seed is. And so you always know what the random number that comes out of it. So the seed is independent from uh, the, the first number that's drawn. And then these are the sort of surprising numerical things that just when you're going quick, um, you just be very careful for. So like, um, you know, remember that point, you know, how to compare 0.18 and 0.127. Like when you're moving fast, like if you're looking at tables or whatever, um, I mean, this happens surprisingly a lot um, on these exams and on the homeworks is that you know, that when you look at these comparisons, you get a lot of, when you look at, oh, 127 is greater than 18. You know, like that, you'd be surprised, but it happens a lot. Um, you know, likewise here, um, you know, uh, 0 0.105 versus 0 0.18, well, that should be 0.18, you know. Um, and then this happens a whole lot on this particular uh, types of questions, is that if your modulo it has a few more zeros than you might be expecting, make sure you don't neglect them. So if you get a state variable inside your random number generator of 71, but your modulo is 1,000, then make sure that you got 0.071 is the random number that comes out. Now, I, I don't put, I'm not going to try to trick you. I'm not trying to say like, aha, do you remember your arithmetic? But sometimes I just miss like, Whenever possible, I'm going to try to generate an example that's not going to lead you down to these dumb little traps. But, I, you know, if I ask you to generate five random numbers, I might be like, you know, I don't know what those five random numbers are going to be. That's the whole point, right? Like, you know, independent. And so I might, like, set up my parameters, and I'll be really proud of myself. And, like, the first four numbers will be very clear. They'll all be, like, three digits. So, you know, we won't be into this. But then the fifth number will come up. And, you know, and then it will happen to be a low number and I'll be running into this. And it's like, and every parameter combination I try, I just always get one of them that has this issue. So if this comes up, you know, it's it's not that I'm trying to trick you. It's just, you know, there's, I, I, I have to stop eventually and say, that's, I'm done with that question. So, so just try to remember these things. So just be very careful when we actually start working with numbers to, you know, remember all your zeros and things like that. Um, other things, so KS versus chi squared. Um, so in the in the KS test, the degree of freedom, the critical uh, value here, it, you have to look up the the number of samples as your degree of freedom. So this is different than the chi squared test, where in that case it's one less than the number of bins. So this always confuses people at first too. And and the reason for this difference is that in the chi squared test. Because it's count data, once you know, if it's got four bins, once you know the counts in the first three bins, you know the count in the fourth bin. It has to be whatever's left over. So there are only three degrees of freedom. That's where that number that comes from, and it matters in the math. That's why in the chi-squared test, if you have four bins, you look up three in the table. 
but there's no such simplex, there's no such conserved sum in the case of the KS. That's why the number of degrees of freedom in the KS test is the number of samples, not the number of samples minus one. So remember when to minus one and when not. And the KS is when you don't. So degrees of freedom, you know, it's exactly how many samples. So if there are eight samples, you go to the eight row to figure out this critical value here. Um, questions about this? Okay, um, other traps. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to write things down on the midterm, but in the homework, we do get issues on how things are phrased. And because these issues matter, I might ask you questions that sort of like what, you know, I might give you like several assertions that you should choose from. And if you, you know, the so stating that the null hypothesis is rejected, I actually want you to like you know give me a conclusion. Well, what is the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis are their uniform random numbers, or that these numbers are drawn from a uniform distribution. And so, um, if the you know you violate if the if the KS test rejects that, then it rejects the um, the null. It rejects that they were drawn from a uniform distribution. So we conclude, uh, you know, that we might be wrong 5% of the time that they are, they are not drawn from a uniform distribution. So make sure you know how to interpret that. And then likewise, if you, um, you know, so that's kind of what I'm saying here. If, if the null is not rejected, then also know that that doesn't actually mean that they're uniform all the time. That might mean that you just have not enough data. So, you know, if I flip a coin once and it comes up heads, that's not enough data for me to know if that's a fair coin. And that's fairness as uniformity. If I flip a coin twice and it comes up heads, heads, that's not enough for me to know if it's a fair coin. I just don't have enough data. It will be that I won't reject the null of uniformity, but that doesn't mean it's actually uniform because it came up heads, heads. Like, you know, if it was non-uniform, it was unfair, it would always come up heads. But with two, I can't. So know that just because it's not rejected, we can't say these are uniform. The best we could say is that we failed to uh, reject, you know, with these data, we failed to reject uniformity, you know, something like that. So that's kind of all I'm saying here. And then, um, so, and this is kind of all I'm kind of saying about this. And then um, is this a good pseudo-random number generator? So what I'm saying is, remember, the properties of a pseudo-random number generator are independence and uniformity. So if, you know, being able to connect, like, I could ask you, here's a bunch of numbers, um, do a KS test, and then after you do the KS test, I could ask, is this, does this appear to be from a good random number generator? And if the KS test rejected uniformity, you would have to say no, because these numbers are non-uniform. And I might not put all those pieces together for you. I'd be looking for you to put that together. Like, here's a KS test. Based on that, is it a good random number generator? And then there's like, you know, that little bit that you have to put together. All right, so any questions about that from that homework from unit C? Okay, and then uh, homework D, the, you know, a lot, more calculation here, you're probably only gonna have one or two on the midterm that are gonna be from this particular section or unit uh, where you'll actually, you know, and, and you imagine they'd be divided up that I'll give you a density function, you calculate the CDF and I ask you, all right, now evaluate the CDF at a number. And then you could imagine that the other one will be, um, I give you a, uh, a CDF, ask you to invert it. You know, that those could be the types of things. Um, I might be a little a little more coy, like I might say here are, and you can see examples of this in the sample midterms, here are a string of random numbers. I'll give you like 10, and then I'll say here is a CDF, and uh, then I'll say generate three samples from the random variant that corresponds to the CDF, and that tells you that you have to invert the CDF and plug in the first three numbers in that string of 10 that I gave you. And so that you evaluate all that. I might ask you simply not like generate the third, I might say, what is the third? So I'd say, you know, so, and then that would actually be a little simpler if I just said, what is the third? Cause then, you know, you just need to grab the third random number and plug it into your inverse CDF, calculate that and that'll be it. And you can see examples of that on the midterm exam. I've done stuff, questions like that. So it's likely that you should be prepared to do that. But um, when you're taking 
PDFs to CDFs, um, don't just take the row wise antiderivatives. So it's really tempting to say, this is my PDF. He asked for the CDF. I'm just going to say the antiderivative of zero is zero. The antiderivative of 0.25 is 0.25x. The antiderivative of 1.5 is 1.5x. Antiderivative of zero is zero. Done. That's my CDF. But you should immediately know that that's not a bad CD or that that is a bad CDF because it starts on zero. Great, but it ends on zero. And CDFs should have a limit of one as you go to infinity. So you know that already something's wrong. Um, and then you should remember, oh, there's something about limits of integration that I need to consider here. So, of course, the right way to do this, um, so this is all I'm saying here, um, is that we need to break this up into this kind of little triangle here where you keep building and building and building. And so I know that um, in this region, it's just the antiderivative of this evaluated from negative infinity to x. For this region, it's all of that previous birth. So you basically take whatever your work was here, plug in the top number, and that just is a constant that gets dumped right here. And that constant gets added to the antiderivative of this, then evaluated for these limits of integration, x to 0.5, and so on and so forth. So if I did that example here, I'm going to plug in, I get 0 here. Um, 0 integrated from negative infinity to 0.5 is going to give me 0. Then 0.25 integrated from 0.5 to x gives me 0.25x minus 0.25 times the, you know, so notice limits of integration and simplify all that stuff. And I go forward. And then eventually um, I get my CDF and it has the right properties. It starts at zero, it ends at one. So any questions about that? Going from PDF to CDF, keeping in account the limits of integration. All right. Um, so uh, are there any, uh, so that's something else is that if I say this is a continuous uh, random variable, so there are no direct delta measures in here, then we also would expect that there shouldn't be any abrupt jumps in the CDF. So that's another sanity check that I always do when I'm designing these problems for you guys is that I say, uh, if this is truly a continuous and not a mixed thing that has both discrete and continuous parts, if it's truly continuous, then the CDF should not have any jumps at any point. So if I evaluate this portion of the CDF at 1.5, it should be equal to this portion of the CDF at 1.5. Um, and likewise, this portion of the CDF at 2 should be this here. So I can see that um, when I'm evaluating, so if I go back, uh, so if I were to do 1.5 times 0.25 minus 0.125, I would get this at this limit. And then if I were to do two in here, so, um, you know, right, this is an easier one for me to do. I'm a little nervous to do this in front of you guys. But if I do this one, I can do two times 1.5 gives me three minus two is one. And that's equal to this one. So the, the kind of patches everything together. And for a continuous, purely continuous random variable, that's what we should have. We shouldn't have any jumps, any stair steps. Because when you see stair steps in the CDF, you know that it's a sign of it being, or having discrete parts. The questions about that? Great. Um, so the other big problem is choosing, you know, how to invert this thing. I give you a CDF. I ask you to derive the quantile function and generate some random variates. Uh, so, you know, you have to remember the CDF maps the entire real line from negative infinity to infinity. So X from negative infinity to infinity to just zero to one. So, um, so these are my negative infinity to infinity. If I plug in these values into the CDF, then I can figure out that this row maps to a particular subset of 0, 1. This row maps to another particular subset of 0 to 1. So that's what I'm saying you should do here. And, um, and the range is the in this CDF, all the points where the, the density function is greater than 0, which corresponds to where the CDF is not flat. So uh, I only care about the support or the range of this random variable. So I'm only going to need to do this inversion for these two pieces here. So you don't have to try like, do I need to invert this? Do I need to invert? This? If it's a constant, 
you can't invert it, right? Because it's it'd be a straight line and you'd be inverting like and that's not a function. So if it's a constant in the CDF, you can ignore those lines. You only need to invert the things that are non-constant in the CDF. So um, so then I can plug in these X's into here. And uh, so that's what I'm going to end up doing here. And I can say for this piece that goes from 0.5 to 1.5, if I plug in those two, then um, I get that the corresponding output goes from 0 to 0.25. So I know my this inverted piece is going to be defined between R between 0 and 0.25. So the X side is 0.5 to 1.5, the R side 0 to 0.25. So then I just invert this little piece. I said R equal to it, solve for X, and there it is. That's what I'll have in this top piece for this range of R. And then I do the same thing for the bottom piece. So for this bottom piece, if I plug in these, into here, I'll get 0.25 to one. And so I'm gonna solve set R equal to this, solve for X, I get this thing for this bottom piece, that's what will go in there. Questions about that? Yeah. Yep, that's fine. Um, in this class, where we have pure discrete random variables and pure continuous random variables, if you're dealing with a continuous random variable, it's got a density function and you've integrated, you shouldn't have any jumps. In later classes or other classes, you mix the two where random variates can be both smooth and have jumps. That's a type of uh, variable that is more advanced. And so these are sort of the training wheels here. And so no jumps. If there are jumps, there's a problem. All right, so sanity check. Um, so what I do when I do these problems, when I design them for you guys, is I do these sanity checks. The great thing for you guys to do too, um, it should be, since these are inverses of each other, that if you pick a number at it, like if I pick zero, if I pick zero, that's uh, zero is not in my, so if I pick one, um, then I could say, well, if I plug in a one that goes into here, uh, 0.25 times one minus 0.125, that'll give me 0.125 out. So then I should be able to then go into here and say, where's 0.125? Well, 0.125 is in here. Well, 0.125 plus 0.125, that's uh, 0.25 times four, that's one. Oh, that's what I started with. So that back and forth, that's a good sanity check. So if you do that in all your ranges, so you plug in a number, you get a number, you plug that number in here, you get the original number back, that's a good sign you did your inversion correctly. Um, so that's kind of what I'm saying here. All right, um, and then uh, the squares. I love the squares because it's just, just because it's a, I mean, in real life, do you get the squares? You actually do quite a bit, but it's but I I we pick on it in this class because it is just such a common problem. Um, so when you have a non-invertible function, so here's a CDF that has a bowl in it, it has a quadratic in it. So this blue part is the CDF. It starts at zero and it goes to one. It includes a half of a quadratic bowl. So this black line, that is x plus one squared, but only the right-hand side of it's being used. So it's only for x from negative one to zero. So only from this part, we're not using it from negative two to negative one. That's the trick is that so, but when you invert it, you need to sort of maintain which half you'd say that like when for our CDF, we only use this half. So for our inverse CDF, we need to make sure that we pick that half. That's what this whole stuff is about. So this, uh, be, you know, this itself is not invertible. Half of it is invertible. You just got to make sure you pick the right half. So, um, so that's kind of what we do here. So we say for this middle portion, we set R equal to it. We solve for X. Now we have this dilemma of, do I want the plus square root of R or the minus square root of R? Well, if you go back here, you have to remember that for that I want negative x's. So my uh, 
my range of this random variable is all negative. There are no values of this random variable that are positive. And for this section in particular, all of these values are negative. So that tells me for these values of R, I want negative values of X. Well, um, if I do um, negative one plus square root of R, then there are values of R that are large enough that will make this positive, right? Or um, maybe there aren't. Uh, I'm sorry, no, yeah, I, I got excited. I thought I was doing a negative positive thing, but I'm not, I'm doing a negative one to zero thing. So if I plug in R equals zero here, I get negative one. If I plug R equals one in here, I get zero. Over here, if I plug in R equals zero, I get negative one, okay. But if I plug in R equals one, I get negative one minus one, that's negative two. Negative two is not in my range. So this side will produce values outside of the range of X. This is the wrong half of the bowl, the wrong half of the quadratic. That's why I pick this one here. I pick the plus in this case. It's not always the plus. You have to look at the CDF and figure out what values do I want and choose the plus or minus accordingly so that you're effectively choosing the correct side of the bowl because you have to cut it and you have to only use, it's not invertible. You can't turn this around. It didn't just give you one value, it would give you two values out. It's not a function at that point. So I, you know, I, I pieced this together into the CDS. So I have to choose the right piece when I invert it. Okay, questions about that? Pretty clear. Okay. So there is our inverse CDS. All right, I think those are all of my homework questions and the rest are just um, greatest hits from the slides up to this point. So I'm happy to start through those. And then as you have questions, just raise a hand and we'll go back and forward. Or if you have questions, burning questions right now, happy to take those. If this is not useful for you, you're happy to have that time back. I won't, you know, you can leave, that's fine. I'm not gonna ask any more eye clicker questions. So any questions? Okay, so, um, for those willing to stay, um, you know, this other things that uh, are, you know, I, I'm going to start from scratch when I make these questions. So do expect constant questions about models. What is a model? The what if questions. So models are things that help us answer what if questions. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Our goal isn't to make them perfect. It's to make them illuminating and useful. Um, so um, of the types of models, you know, we've got you know, these are dynamic models because they describe things that move over time. Uh, they're stochastic models. What is the random, you know, this is sort of a pet peeve of mine that random and stochastic are not synonyms. You use one to define the other. A stochastic model is a model that uses randomness in lieu of something else, in lieu of a more detailed model. So a stochastic model is a random model, but it's not like they're not synonyms. You can't just say that, you know, when people, it's very loose to say there is stochasticity in the world. That means my model of the world is one in which I assume that everything's random. But in reality, there is a perfectly deterministic explanation for every outcome of the world, um, at, at least until you get down to like the level of an atom. So, um, so we don't actually view the world as being random, but the only way we can realistically model it practically in computers and our heads on paper is if we assume it's random. And that's why stochastic comes from the Greek for guess or conjecture. So stochastic is not a synonym for random. Stochastic is the use of randomness to make models simpler. Uh, so why use computational models? You know, there's, uh, we talked about reasons for that. What are the strengths and weaknesses? So mental models have strengths and weaknesses. Um, analytical models have strengths and weaknesses. Computational models have strengths and weaknesses. What are the different types? So uh, agent-based models versus discrete event system simulation models um, uh, versus um, uh, um, the system dynamics models. We'll get a whole lot on this, but just, you know, it's good to know, like, because we're using one of those modeling types to position it among the others. Um, of that, you know, uh, the, we've already kind of talked about this, but the definitions of these things, the definitions of these things, being able to do a hand simulation. So um, actually, you know, now that you're opening up Arena, uh, you may have noticed that Arena has these little um, 
these are kind of getting like archaic, these symbols, what they, but you know, that's got this sort of skip here where you in arena, you can actually have it go one through these. So, um, so just like we have you do the hand simulation time by time right now in your classes or in the labs, you've just been hitting play on the early arena models you've been building, but you actually, instead of hitting play, you can hit the step button and then you can actually watch it go from event to event, to event, to event. And that's the same thing that you're doing by hand when I give you these tables. So know how to build these tables. So that means like I could give you this and being able to then reconstruct that timeline um, and, you know, and figure out and you can know like, okay, these activities, these service activities, how they fall into play, um, know that delays are generated by misaligned activities like we see here. So those are all our delays. Um, the delays we have to run the sim to see Whereas the activities we know in a table ahead of time, that's the, you know, that's why these are the inputs and these are the outputs. Um, activity we know ahead of time, that's why it's an unconditional weight versus a delay. We don't know ahead of time, that's why it's a conditional weight. We manage them with state variables and uh, lists and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's, those are our DES fundamentals. So basically that's, you know, before the midterm, it was like, what is a model and what is DES modeling? And then review of probability. And then how do we generate numbers and variants? Those are the three things we've done. So questions on the modeling basics. Any confusion about the terms? Okay. Um, so probability and common distributions. So uh, the, uh, you know, this term input modeling is good to know. This idea that the distributions we pick are the actual inputs to our systems. The entities aren't the inputs. The entities are just water flowing through the fountain, but the shape of the fountain, that's kind of what we're evaluating um, and how fast the water flows. So it's kind of like the shape of the fountain or the diagram and arena and how fast the water flows over it, um, like by the pump, like the pump schedule, that's sort of like the input distributions. So it's not actually the water itself because those entities just get recycled over and over again. And so um, our choice of probabilistic models that goes into our simulation models, that's input modeling. Um, these are the probabilistic models I'd like you to know. You don't have to memorize the formulas to them, but you should know that if I ask you, uh, if I need an input model for an additive process that is unbounded in either direction, that it's practically unbounded, like I, I give you the, um, and it's an additive process where I can say the mean is this, standard deviation is this, and a standard deviation is so much smaller than the mean that I basically can, um, can, I don't have to worry, like it's practically unbounded, it basically goes in either direction. You should think, well, it's additive, and he gave me mean and variance, then a normal, uh, without any other information, I should choose a normal. Um, or if he said that there's these failure times that are independent from each other, and they're non-negative because they're failure times, and, if, and here's the mean, if that's all I gave you, you should know that's an exponential. It's the sum of exponentials, Erlang k. So basically, the general idea of what each one of these are and what they're for, those are stuff you should know. Um, uh, what a Poisson process is and how it's related to the exponential and the Poisson. It's important to know. Um, and here's a cheat sheet for those. So these are the ones that I want you to know. These are brief descri descriptions of what they're for. These are the key parameters. So you know that this is a two-parameter distribution. This is a one-parameter distribution. Know the term memoryless. Um, know that an exponential is memoryless. Those are good things to know. Uh, on the discrete side, same idea. Geometric is the memoryless discrete. It's basically the, the flip side, so to speak, of the exponential. If you needed to discretize an exponential, you get a geometric. So that's our probability, at least the, uh, that's both the, it's, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to ask you about sample spaces and those sorts of things, but the distributions, that's the big thing. Any questions about that? Yep. Yeah, I might give you a description of a of a type of thing that you would then ask, like, what type of variable would you use for this description? Um, that was the sort of thing you could do. Um, I might, you know, if one or 
a question or so that makes sure you know that the shape of a probability density function versus a CDF, I only mentioned that because I didn't talk about that here, like knowing those, because we did a couple of those examples where we had like pictures of distributions, you'd say, oh, that's got to be the density function and that's got to be the CDF. Those are other things to know. But um, but yeah, that's, and if you get, if you look at the example uh, midterms online, you'll see examples of exactly how I, I ask these and it'll be very similar to that. Okay, and then the last thing, we've already sort of beat uh, uh, this, to, you know, maybe to death already today, but, um, you know, I just want to point out, I want you to know, to be able to do a simple chi-square test for uniformity and a KS test for uniformity, you should know the term autocorrelation, but the test is be able to do this runs above and below the mean test. And if you need this test, I will give you the mean, so you're not going to have to calculate the mean of 30 numbers. So if I don't give you the mean, then maybe your head thought I was asking for independence, but in reality, I was asking for uniformity. And go back and reread the question, and it might tell you that you should be using a chi-squared. And then likewise, for random variant generation, um, you know, we already kind of talked about this. Know how to go from PDF to CDF, know how to invert the CDF, and know how to then use random numbers with that inverse CDF to generate random variants. Um, you know, the, the big thing, if I ask you, what are the required features of a, C, a PRNG? Uniformity and independence. These other things are desired. It's good to maybe know about them. I'd say particularly good to know about this seed, like why we, what the seed is for, what it allows us to do. Um, but the, if I ask you, what's the most important thing, you know, it, you shouldn't say it's fast or it has a long cycle. I mean, those are really important, but the most important is uniformity and independence. Um, know how to do the LCG. Uh, so know how to generate, if I give you a seed and these parameters, know how to generate these numbers. Or if I do it in kind of a, a KG way where I might like give you the seed, the increment, the modulus, and I might say, if the first random number of random number is 0.02, then what must be the multiplier? You know, it's kind of this like a backwards way of doing that. Just making sure you know the formula and how to use it. Um, then, uh, so yeah, so I just talked about this for uh, uniformity independence, the tests. So this is a, a the, our example for chi-squared, a bunch of numbers divide the whole interval. This is a common problem is that you don't just look for the max of the numbers that I gave you and the min of the numbers I gave you and divide that up. You say, it said, I'm testing for uniformity. Uniform num random numbers come from zero to one. So I'm going to divide zero to one into four. I'll tell you how many intervals to use on the midterm. For the final, that'll be more up to you. Uh, but uh, I'll say, you know, use four bins. And then, so, you know, I divide them into these four. I then calculate uh, how many of these numbers fall into each one of these four. I then figure out how many I would expect. If the expected number is less than five, then there's no way you can use a chi-squared. And so something's wrong. Either you read the instructions wrong and I wanted you to use a KS test or well, one of your calculations was wrong. And so that would be a red flag, assuming that the exam wasn't written wrong. And then calculate your statistic, compare it to the table, Remember that if I asked you for four bins, you look in row three in the table because that's only three degrees of freedom because it's a count and the counts have to add up to the total. Um, so if there's six bins, you look in row five in the table. So that's your chi-squared. So any questions about the chi-squared? Same chi-squared you did in whatever 380 or something. But for uniformity only in this case, we won't worry about Poisson and stuff like that until after the midterm. And then the KS test. So this is maybe a newer test for some of you. Um, I'll, if you were asked to do a KS test, I'll give you a small number, a, a small a number of numbers, and um, and they probably won't be sorted because that's one of the features of the KS test. You have to sort them, and um, and then given these, like I might give you a small number, a small sequence of numbers, and make sure that you know that you need to use a KS test, because there's absolutely no way you could use a chi-squared test for this, because there's no way to get the expected number in each bin to be less than five, or to be more than five, if there's only five numbers. So then from there, uh, you, uh, you sort them, and then you um, bracket them with the boundaries of the interval that they should have fallen into, if they were uniformly distributed. 
And then you just calculate the distances from each one of those boundaries. And then you take the max of those distances. So in this particular case, uh, 0.4 minus 0.14 gives him 0.26, which is bigger than the rest of those. And that's your statistic. So you look in the table that I gave you, because there were five numbers here, you look in row five of the KS table there, because I asked for a significance level of 5%, you look there, and um, that is your, your threshold. This is lower than that threshold, so we fail to reject. Questions on the KS test? Okay. Um, and then autocorrelation. So uh, this is, I think, a slide that I didn't get to go over um, this uh, in, in this semester, but uh, I mentioned that autocorrelation is just a, I, I, I describe that autocorrelation is how well a point in time correlates with points later in time in a bunch of data. And, uh, and so if you look at you know these sample numbers, so if I'm zoomed in here, so if I look at a bunch of data from zero to 50 or zero to 500, um, this is just a zoomed in version of these data here. And so for each one of these data points, you could say like, well, uh, if I take a point now and I add um, a certain number of points to it, so I like say add 40 points to it. So now I'm saying at this point versus this point, you could take that pairing and then group those uh, over time, and then you, this would always be your X, and this would always be your Y, and then you could put them and plot them against each other and fit a line to them and say, what is the correlation coefficient between this input and this output? And that gives you a so-called autocorrelation. So if you did that for every distance between the points, you could get this autocorrelation function, and it would look like this. And I'm not going to ask you to be able to, to interpret this on the midterm, but this is just a summary of what I just said here. So this is saying that when there is zero distance between them, when the input is equal to the output, you have 100% predictability. If you know the input, you know the output because they're the same point. And for these particular data that I generated, when I look at them, it looks like this is kind of random, but if you kind of see, there seems like there might be a little bit of periodicity, like there these peaks that seem to be spaced roughly uniformly, and that's what kind of shows up here. This is saying that um, every 10, you have high positive correlation. Every five, you have high negative correlation. So this is saying that if I know a point now, um, 10 samples later, I have a, a pretty good idea of that it's also going to be a positive point and at 10 samples later. But five samples later, it will be an opposite sign. But the immediate, you know, after only three or four samples, I have a lot less predictability. So that's how you read this sort of thing. And that's what we're looking for. How predictable is it? So the, the least predictable signal, so-called white noise, the autocorrelation is 100% here and 0% everywhere else. That's and and that's that you know that means that uh, every frequency is in there. That's why it's called white noise. So there's no predictability left. Um, and um, so the you know th being able to interpret this is not that important. But knowing the term autocorrelation is a measure of how predictable a time series is later based on knowing what it is now. That's what I want you to know. That term autocorrelation. But what we're going to do when we do a test for independence is the runs above and below the mean test. And so I give you 30 numbers. You would normally have to calculate the mean of those 30 numbers. I will give you the mean because I'm not going to have you bother with doing this long calculation. And, um, and then for every number, you replace it with a zero if it's below its mean or a one if it's above. So you turn that sequence into this sequence. So it basically turns them into coin flips. Then you analyze if these are coin flips where one is heads and zero is tails, then you effectively say, how fair is this coin? So you count the number of heads, you count the number of tails. And then based on that, if it's really independent, you should say for a coin, a, a coin, even if it's unfair, a coin is still independent. Every flip is independent of the previous flips. So for that unfair coin, how many runs would we expect? Well, what's a run? It is, you know, every time the sign switches is the end of a run. So there are 19 runs in this sequence, and they are listed right here. 
So if I know there are 19 runs in the sequence, I'm just going to calculate a Z score that is going to tell me is 19 within the number of runs I'd expect from an unfair coin with this ratio of heads to tails. And in order for me to do that, I lean on these formulas. These are good formulas for you to know or to write down, to bring with you. I'm not going to give you these formulas, but they're pretty ugly to memorize. So that's why I'd recommend writing them down. But um, And then these two formulas, you basically, this calculates if uh, if this was a an unfair coin that's independent, this would be the mean number of runs you get from that coin. This would be the variance of those runs you get from the coins. So to calculate a z-score, you turn variance into standard deviation by square rooting it, and then you just turn this r into a z-score. Subtract off the mean, divide by the square root, and uh, then you get a z-statistic, which you can then look in your z-table, and it will be a one-tailed z-table just because that's conventional, but it's a two-tailed test. So I'm going to ask you for a 5% significance level. So you'll look in the 0.025 or the 2.5% row. That will give you your threshold. It'll be 1.96. I'm not going to ask you for other than a 5%. So if, if you need this number, if you memorize 1.96, just think on the midterm for every Z test that Ted asks me, the threshold's going to be 1.96. You don't have to look like that. That's, it's going to be that. I'm not going to be cute and say, well, for a 10% confidence level, not on this test, maybe on the final, but not on this test. So then I compare 1.96 to 1.23. 1.23 is less than 1.96, um, and, um, and it's in absolute value. So if, uh, if this were flipped, if it was negative 1.23, so again, I, I look here for the absolute value, um, then I determine whether to reject. In this case, I do not reject because it's too small. And, um, and that's, that's it for the uh, for uh, testing for uniformity and independence. So, any questions on that? Those are the three, you know, very kind of numerical calculation things that you should know how to do. And then the only other thing I've got for you then is the inverse transform stuff, which again we kind of started with, and this is all stuff that I'm basically uh, repeating from earlier today. So. Um, you know, the, you know, take a random number, choose the variate, uh, you know, this is what that looks like. Um, this, you know, it's also called the quantile function. So yeah, I only put this up here because if you want practice, like these are the quantile functions for these CDF. So if you want to try inverting each one of these and making sure you get this out, then, you know, that gives you like, you know, maybe good, you know, if you actually want to go from PDF to CDF to quantile function and you match all of these, then that's good practice. And um, so that's kind of that thing. Now, what what we didn't talk as much about, but you should know, it's also the, the exact same stuff for discrete random variables. And so it is a very, and you can see again on the sample midterms, it's out there. Um, I will probably have one, maybe two questions that are related to doing inverse transform sampling with discrete random variables. And in that case, I'll give you a probability mass function. And so I might say, I want to generate these three outcomes. Here are a bunch of random numbers uh, that you can draw from. Give me the first three outputs from a discrete random variable generator, random variant generator. And you'll have to know that I need to convert the PDF to a CDF. And that CDF will give me the boundaries here um, that will tell me how to convert the random numbers into random outcomes. And uh, if you were to do this in Arena, so you should know this syntax here, you take the, in, the quantile function and you just encode it as a list. So this is the... The uh, CDF is the first argument. The, the outcome that goes with that is the second argument. So all the odd arguments are the CDF values. So that's why I say it's, it's like putting the quantile function on a list where the input is the CDF and the output is the outcome. That's the quantile function. So it's just in, in basically encoding the CDF where the outcomes are the even terms and the corresponding cumulative probabilities are the odd terms. So I might say... Um, here is a disk, uh, like I'll say disk one one, uh, you know, point five two, uh, whatever you know, whatever's left over three or something like that. Given this disk line, draw the 
first three numbers that arena might generate if you were to ask it to do that and you would have to know oh he get, effectively by giving me the disc line he gave me the cds so now that i know the cds then i know what boundaries to use to draw to do that conversion and um and that's basically um and that's basically it so um all right so any questions we're at the end of the review slides if anything does come up, feel free to reach out, you know, Slack, DM, email. Um, uh, I have a pretty full schedule Friday, so I might not be able to get you during the day, but should be able to get to you um, in the evening, um, definitely uh, on Saturday. Um, oh, yeah, I guess so. Be able to do CDF, PDF, you know, if I give you one of these, be able to sort of say which one's the CDF, there's the CDF, there's the PDF, this is nothing. That's an inverse CDF. Um, yeah, I think and that that's it right there. That's it. Now we're done. Sorry. So if I don't hear from you, good luck. Um, I will send out an announcement to say exactly what the availability windows will be, whether it'll open on Monday. Um, if you have any questions about the timing, again, please feel free to email. And that's all I've got for you. So have a nice weekend. Good luck. Um, so those are your preference. So where I was saying that um, I'm either going to open the stage one. Um, so that's uh, the, the, those are the options here. So I can open the stage one to make it available Monday, Tuesday, and then stage two, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's option A. That's the option that I would prefer because it gives students who are traveling at the end of the week the most flexibility. Um, the other option, though, is for it to be open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for stage one, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday for stage two. And then the other two options are identical to the first two, but I just drop Monday. And so the reason I do that is like, if you think you want to ask me content questions on Monday, the exam can't be open. So once the exam's open, then I can't be available for content questions. So you just choose your preference. And then I'll use that poll to figure out, um, to make my decision about how to set the availability. Um, the, the, the exam will be, yep. well, it, it, it's, well, the way it works is that for first stage, um, it, you can take it any time in that availability window, anytime. Like you don't have to come to here. You could just Monday at, at 9.43 a.m. You could start it, but then it starts the clock so that you've got 90 minutes after you start it to complete the exam. Well, that's the that's the options here. As I'm saying, it'll like the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that would mean that you can start it any time Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I don't care when, as long as you finish it before the end of Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure, let me um, just stop here.